My name's Wolf. I love Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer, Sexford Hookers, and Extreme Metal, and I love the fucking Spoets. I like sex, beer, and the fucking Spoets. Uh, my name is Andy Miller, and uh, also known in some circles as the notorious prank phone caller James at 15. And uh, I was the, I was the booking agent at the Caboose nightclub where the Spoets played a bunch of times. And My name is uh, Wolf. I am the uh, editor right now. I'm president of the editor of Scumpy's Metal 666 webzine. At the time I was introduced to the Spoets, I was uh, the bouncer at the Caboose, and I was also co-editor of a fanzine called. Scum Piece, which I did with Andy Miller, who also booked the shows there. For about four or five years there, it was uh, the, uh, one of the only places in the area where uh, the more extreme underground heavy metal and punk rock bands would perform. And would, we uh, had a lot of crazy bands in there, including the Spoets. <laughs> you could say the Caboose was probably the most extreme. You know, it wasn't just a music club. It was pretty much an extreme music club, whether it was punk or metal. And Andy Miller, who booked the shows there, he has a unique sense of uh, music taste. The right? first time I had ever heard of the Spoets was they had actually, uh, I don't know if it was you or Rick, sent a demo pack, and, a, uh, and it, instead of a CD there, or a tape, there was a VHS tape, and it, had the, and it came to the club, and uh, the owner of the club, Ed Warner, had, he was like, hey, man, you check this one out, you know, and uh, and we watched a video called Kung Fu Jesus, and uh, it was pretty wacky, and he's like, these guys want a gig, and I was like, all right, you know, and at first he was like, well, be, you know, that band looks kind of nutty, be, you know, be careful, and he's like, there's footage of them doing all sorts of weird stuff on that tape. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, it'll be fun, and he's like, well, you know. The way I was introduced to the sports was when they first got up on stage at the caboose and Ed, one of the owner of the caboose, came up to me and goes, watch this band. You know, we've seen a video and they do weird shit. So just watch them. Which to me was equal to saying, watch this guy, he's a terrorist and he's got a bomb strapped to his chest. <laughs> All right? After that first show, we, you know, it wasn't nothing compared to some other things they've done in the future. But it was after that show, whenever the sports came back, there was the level of anxiety in the club it was through the roof. Scumfest was, uh, it, 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 we started it, uh, it, was it was originally more like a, a, a show called uh, the Caboose Fest, um, where we had a lot of like our favorite local bands, which just happened to be bands that everybody else around the area hated. They were all the more extreme heavy metal or punk rock bands. For locally, and uh, the uh, local media um, weekly newspaper that uh, really uh, always had it in for us, I guess, uh, uh, said that it was uh, you should have called it Scumfest <laughs> because of the people that would be there and the and the bands that uh, played. And uh, the shows that continually got more insane each time. Now the big one everybody talks about is um, Scumfest 98. And I can tell you, if you were not there to witness it firsthand, you, you're going to think to yourself, I just missed the greatest thing in the world. Because after that show, and I was straight because I was working and I was bouncing, and I was straight to all these shows. But after that show, it was like you looked at these people's faces, and you know, half of them had this face on, you know, this look on their face like they were a virgin who just came out of a horror house, or they're a survivor of a plane crash. You know, they have this weird look on their face like, I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm still alive. You know, touching themselves, that's the way they were. It was incredible. You know, 98 was probably one of the best poets performances ever. 98 was like porn. You know, it was incredible. And, and the whole audience was going nuts. Well, I always like the fireworks firing into the crowd. I, I don't know, call me a sicko, but I enjoy, uh, I just really enjoy that. And In North Carolina, when the sports were playing the caboose, you know, the law was no nudity on stage. And technically, there wasn't nudity 
at 1998. Technically. <laughs> but there was nudity. There was. And it was uh, like simulated sex. In North Carolina, you're not allowed to do simulated sex on stage. Watch the video. <laughs> There's stuff on there. Look at the photographs. I took some of those photographs. I took a picture of the one girl with her face and the other girl's ass. You know, that's my photograph, you know. <coughs> I'm proud of that. In fact, it turned out to be a button. Not, out... not simulated. That was not simulated. No, that was not simulated. I can't say they enjoyed it or anything. The guy on stage getting whipped by those giant rubber dongs. You know, there's a guy with his pants down on stage, right in front of the drum kit, getting whipped by two girls with two, these giant dongs are about this big. You know, just beating the living crap out of them, you know? It's like, oh, I, came, I came to see some music, you know? I'm seeing a fucking s &M show, you know? Wow, that was worth 10 bucks, you know? That's what I'm saying. It's like a whorehouse or a plane crash, you know? Either way, you're like... Both those times, the Spohets topped everything I'd previously seen them do. As far as destruction on stage, uh, nudity and debauchery, and all-around fun. Live pee show? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, some nut came on stage and uh, one of the girls peed on him. That was, <laughs> that was pretty... I, that was at Scumfest, I think. That was yeah, at Scumfest. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, there was, you know, fireworks and other other craziness. There, the video's out there. <laughs> Look it up. You'll see. But, and you also got to never forget the grind guitar. I mean, people to this day go, what the hell is a grind guitar? <laughs> and they see this, and they see the sparks shooting out all over the place. And I have been lucky enough to uh, be involved with the grind guitar by holding up a um, crowbar in front as Scott you know, shoot, goes away with the grind guitar. And everybody always asks me, you know, I said, aren't you worried about your fingers? I said, no, I trust him. He's a professional. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> I'm here to tell you. <laughs> and show all your fingers? Show all my fingers. <laughs> show. The whole... After they're finished playing, the whole front of the stage is like broken glass, broken TV sets. I think uh, the one time there was a broken wash machine. A broken you know? toilet. Broken toilet, yeah, broken toilet, right? And 2010. <laughs> yeah, 2010, or... Uh, the Spoets uh, smashed uh, an astronomical amount of televisions on the stage and on the floor in front of the stage. And uh, a drunk fell into the pile of uh, TV sets and cut himself open. Uh, that was uh, Icy Mike, yeah, our bass Icy player. Mike. <laughs> that was a Spoets band. <laughs> Fire, you know, all this stuff. Who was too drunk to fly? Spoets, uh, I got some, some things yeah, to say about that yeah, show. Yeah, was at that show and. Uh, the owner of the club, Keith Fairweather, his he he's a, guy, a man known to uh, accept damn near anything at, at uh, Volume Eleven uh, Tavern. But uh, he was heard to say, "Oh no, he didn't." <laughs> when he when he was watching the Spoets. And this happened in 2010 mm -hmm. when uh, Scumpet when uh, Andy did the Scumpet's reunion. And Spoets came on stage. Now, just for the record, I've been going to shows and concerts for 30 years. I've left you know, clubs with broken bones, I've left bloody, you know, sometimes not even my own blood on me. But when the sports played in 2010 at the bottom 11, that was the first time ever in my life that I ever thought that I was going to leave a club maimed for life. <coughs> they started shooting off fireworks. Scott had this vest on and started shooting off these fireworks. And I was next to uh, the photographer, this guy, Jay. And when those fireworks start shooting all over the place, you know, and I'm, I'm ex-military, I just went up against the wall, and I thought tracers were bouncing around me. Jay afterwards goes, now I know what a war photographer feels like. I had the tightest asshole you can believe. I just closed my asshole, put my hands up like this, and just wait till it's over, you know, and I just, all these tracers are flying, bouncing off the wall all over the place. I mean... Boats are banned at volume 11, <coughs> but, uh, so, for, for now, anyways... <laughs> Rock. I don't think it's a lot of shock rock. It's all about shocking the audience, and you know, okay, we shocked you, and then they walk away, and then that's it. But I think the Spoets were actually shocking themselves. They were. They actually lived. I mean, this is their lifestyle. So their lifestyle was on stage for everybody to view. 
You know, this wasn't something like, oh, we're only going to do this once a night, and oh, I hope you enjoyed the show. No, that was their life all the time. And just they were sharing it with the rest of the world. Uh, there's always the people that taped. When I was taping a lot of shows and stuff, there was all, at one point there was like, this is before YouTube and everybody's been desensitized to everything, reality TV. But back then, everybody was, people were filming punk rock and heavy metal bands and trading tapes back and forth in the underground. And I was into that a little. And, uh, you know, as everybody, all the tapers were like, man, you got to see this one. You got to see this one. You know, check this one out. Check this band out. And the Spoets were like right up there in the top of people passing tapes around. Check this band out, you know, check this show out, you got to see this one, and a lot of people, you know, that was up there with, you know, with the people that were trading all the G.G. Allen tapes, and you know, it was like, a, you know, when I was t a tape trader, it was like the Misfits, G.G. Allen, the Spoets, uh, any scene, and a handful of other, you know, uh, bands that were just, always people were trading those tapes, they were, they were, you, you, the Spoets probably would have actually, if that stuff was actually sold instead of traded and professionally distributed, maybe Spoets might have actually made a little money. <laughs> no, we don't care. We get did the song, Hey Boys, Where'd You Get the Midget? And here's the irony. Leah had a baby who is a midget. <laughs> so the Spoets caused a midget baby. I mean, the Spoets <laughs> might have caused a midget baby. You know, they might have infected, <laughs> the Spoets might have infected this woman's womb before, long before she ever had sex with the you know, father of the child. And they have a midget baby. You know, that's not named Scott, so it's a girl. You know, it's another irony, you know. But yeah, you know, once in a while, someone will always go, man, I, I remember that, that band, that one band where all the, the girls on stage are crazy, and I go, the Spoets, and they go, yeah, the Spoets. Man, I remember that show. Man, you know, and it's like, you just see this look in their eyes, you know? And, you know, that's something that's part of history. You just can't take that away. And that's, you know, that's probably why you're watching this.